Okay, so welcome everyone. Here we go. Uh, the first library short that's up is Libraries and Archives in Support of Natural History Using Historical Records to Rule Out a Local Extirpation of Bobcats. Okay, Nick, it's up to you. So Ray. hold on. Oh, can I go now? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right, great. <laughs> so, all right. Um, as we were joking around before, uh, I am a fairly informal person, but to introduce, for you, uh, introduce myself to those of you who may not know, uh, my name is Nick Gardner. I'm the library director at WVU Potomac State College. Um, I also have a undergraduate degree in biology, and I have been regularly working with um, colleagues whose relate, re relationships with I developed as an undergraduate and in the time from when I finished my undergraduate to now. Uh, one of them is Dr. Ryan Shell, and typically the way that he and I work is he proposes a biological or other natural history problem, and I kind of come in and look for how can we solve that problem or how can we better answer that problem using library collections. Now, whether it's like the, you know, the traditional resources of a library or if it's getting into something like archives. Now, one thing I'm gonna, in the interest of disclosure, none of my library's actual like archival collections were used for this. So this really benefited from how much people have made digitally available. And I'll be touching on that later in the talk. Uh, in the interest in disclosure, I think it's important that people know this talk complements a poster that was presented uh, at the um, section meeting of GSA earlier this year. That poster is available online from my ResearchGate page. Uh, you can also get to it at that URL. Uh, and after this presentation, I'll be uploading a copy of this PowerPoint to my ResearchGate uh, gate page. So if you wanna be able to download that, get all the image credits for where I found all the pic uh, adorable pictures of Bobcats from, they're all credited there instead of putting it right into the slide. Uh, I know that this isn't like, like a super big thing for this conference, but it is okay to talk about this talk on social media. Uh, we're moving forward pretty quickly and the journals that we're targeting for publishing this are not gonna care if somebody tweets or you know Facebooks around it. All right, so how we got into this, um, the tradition, or sorry, we'll be, what I'll be doing to go over this is I'll be defining the problem. I'll be giving some solutions for how we solve the problem. And we'll also be talking about what we can do to empower our archival collections to benefit other natural history research projects. Um, so basically, when it comes to bobcats, uh, they're a larger than a house cat, predatory cat, and they've been presumed in Ohio to have gone extinct uh, sometime prior to 1858, or sorry, 1850 common era and that they likely repopulated in the 1970s, especially coming over the border from Kentucky and West Virginia. Um, the first confirmed sighting from the perspective of ODNR was uh, in Scioto County uh, in 1946. Um, and largely most of their accounts, like I said, assumed that the golf cat was extinct uh, in most of the state. Uh, this got complicated when my uh, co-author on this talk was doing some caving work uh, related to his job with the Forest Service and discovered a subfossil. Now, for those of you who aren't paleontologically inclined, subfossil means it's not quite old enough to have fully fossilized, but it's older, but there is some mineral replacement happening. So in a cave in Western Ohio, he found a bobcat canine along with other materials. They were able to date it and found that it postdates when bobcats were actually supposed to be extinct. Uh, this uh, assemblage is actually going to be published in the Ohio Journal of Science later this year. I am not part of that project, um, but just as a heads up, that information is coming forward. All right, so that leads us to some questions. If the common narrative is that bobcats went extinct, then we shouldn't be able to find evidence to the contrary. Uh, and so that poses two questions. One, can we find more remains of bobcats that were collected between 1850 to 1970 CE in museum collections? Or can we find other lines of evidence that might determine if bobcats were present or not in Ohio during this time period, which again would rule out a total and complete extirpation of bobcats in Ohio? 
Um, before we move on to trying to answer these, we need to think about bobcats a little bit. I know that not everybody here is necessarily as passionate about natural history as I am. So some things we want to think about is how commonplace are bobcat sightings to start with? And are there aspects of bobcat biology which would make them harder to spot in the field? Uh, sneak or the uh, short answer to that last one is absolutely, as you've probably seen in some of these slides. Um, when we look at try attempts to sight bobcats, one of the things that we see is that while ODNR has put a really concerted effort of trying to get the word out of please look for bobcats, um, a lot of where we're seeing the like sightings come into play are through trail and security cameras, which as many of you may know, have had an absolute explosion on the market in the last decade, like the price has really come down on them. And ODNR acknowledges this. Uh, I mean, just because they've become so much cheaper, there's so many more people out trying to spot for them. The fact that we also have the cameras out there looking all the time. So we don't really know if the seeming like increase in sightings is due solely to a jump in the recovery of their populations or just because there's more people out there looking for this. Uh, when we look at other states, this pattern of extirpation is assumed to have happened across most of the Midwest. So if we look at it, for example, at Illinois, uh, with more pressure on deer hunters to report bobcat sightings, we see an increase in the number of sightings happening. Um, however, they're still incredibly rare when we take it not just from like raw percentages of did you see a bobcat, but we actually try to like break this down. And this is data from IDNR. Um, you know, it's something like one bobcat sighting per thousand hours of observation. So that's an incredibly rare animal. Um, another great example is if we go to actually down to the southeast in Kiowa Island, um, there was a wildlife biologist actively studying bobcats. And when he was putting out live traps for every 100 carnivores, so that's like, you know, your, your skunks, possums, things like that, like that are out there trying to catch. He's only catching like one bobcat. And this is a pretty small area. It's under 16 square miles. Um, there's a, a mix of urban and uh, wild environments. And it was estimated at the time there was something like 30 to 35 individuals. Uh, just as a side note, the Kiowa population uh, collapsed due to disease. I think it's supposed to be like under six individuals now. But the point is, you know, there, there should still be like a higher catch rate, but they're pretty wily and they don't like getting caught. Um, in general, why are bobcats kind of hard to spot? Well, one, anybody here who owns a cat, come on, we're all librarians. So I know a good number of us have cats. Uh, they like to be solitary. Um, they're not monogamous, uh, that when a breeding pair gets together, which, you know, a lot, a lot of wildlife biologists like to say, like the easiest time to spot a bobcat is when there's more than one together, but breeding pairs are only together for a couple of days. Um, and they tend to live in marginal environments, which make them harder to spot because they're moving between both woodlands and grasslands. Uh, they're ambush predators, so they tend to stay hidden, unlike, you know, if you've, you've ever gone out looking for uh, wild dogs, coyotes, things like that. Uh, while those tend to be cryptic as well, uh, they spend more time pacing and patrolling, and it makes them a little bit easier to spot. Uh, the other thing, too, is bobcats have a very cryptic patterning. They've got those arm bars. They've got the face masks. They have a lot of stuff that really breaks up their profile on the terrain, and it makes them harder to spot. Okay, so after that little uh, jaunt over to talk about bobcat biology, let's remind ourselves of the questions. One. Do we have evidence in museums of these things, of bobcats being collected? Uh, and then two, are there other lines of evidence that we can look at? All right, well, there was a certain global event that happened in March of 2020 that has had like, you know, effects for the last two, three, like, sorry, two years or so of anyone trying to view museums-based collections. Uh, thankfully, a lot of museums, including the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, are participants in uh, GBIF, which is a big online database for sharing collections data. Uh, when we looked at that for like participating institutions, including those that we felt should have collections from Ohio, we could only find one record that was uh, a, that could account for a bobcat uh, within this time frame, and that was from 1949 in Toledo. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get other collection information at the time. Um, because of just the often curators were not even working in the museum. They were like out of their collections, working at home, staff were furloughed. Some in some cases, staff were laid off. 
Uh, and one point that Brian kept, or sorry, that Ryan kept bringing up over and over again is that small museums, unlike you know bigger ones like the Smithsonian's, tend to not keep multiple examples of larger vertebrates. And yes, a bobcat would be considered a larger vertebrate just because they take up something like a whole cubic foot of space on a shelf. So they're, they're sizable, they take up space. And it's like, how many examples of a bobcat do you necessarily need? Um, all right. So we asked ourselves, are there other lines of evidence? Well, as a librarian, I was like, absolutely. There are all these great historic records that are available digitally and easy to access. Uh, some of them are made available through the efforts of uh, state level entities um, and, and even like local ones. A great example actually on of one of a state level or local entity here that is not actually in Ohio was the Ohio County Public Library that's in West Virginia. Those of you know, of course, that that borders Ohio and the Wheeling New and the big newspaper on there is the Wheeling Paper. So you could get a lot of information about what was happening in Eastern Ohio in the bordering counties. All right, so I mean, a lot of this was made, this project is made forward because so many collections were digitally available. If it wasn't for these efforts to digitize this information, um, this project couldn't have gone forward for like the last, you know, year or so, we would have had to have just waited till you could actually get in-house to a collection. All right, and so this is just some selected occurrences that we found. This is not the whole data set. There's like 100 plus accounts and there. I know that there are better ways to visualize this data, but what I wanted to basically show is that we find that there are basically throughout the entire period of time that bobcats are supposed to be extirpated and not present in the state. They are actually kind of like all over the state anyway. Uh, we suspect that like what's happened here is it's just a lack of coordination uh, between wildlife professionals. And then we have to look at when the ODNR was established and when they began to really heavily monitor for bobcats. Um, this kind of stuff happens with other less charismatic species as well. But in general, what it seems to suggest is that like across the entire state, they may not have been extirpated. Uh, it may have been more of just a pattern across the southern half. But again, like we have so much data that shows like, oh, no, nope, bobcats are kind of around and they're kind of all over the place. All right. Um, so one of the things that makes us think that they're, they weren't extirpated is understand like the age, basically the turnover gap. Uh, for bobcats is around five years. They reach sexual maturity at two years. They typically don't live longer than seven years. Males will reproduce with multiple females throughout the year. So the fact that like for most of our sightings, we don't really have gaps greater than five years suggests that there are continuous generations of bobcat present. Uh, one of the things that people don't realize is a bobcat's range might, uh, you know, a bobcat may go within a year as many as 60 miles or so across the territory. Um, so it's really hard to, to look back and assess this. And of course, we know that not every occurrence should necessarily be taken uh, as gospel, but the fact that we have so many occurrences uh, really leads us to suspect that they were not wiped out. Um, so we're, basically what we're left with is they may have been rare, but bobcats are kind of a rare predator to start with. Uh, they sit really high at the, at the top of the trophic chain, so they tend to not be around um, at the, you know, you tend to not have as many. And our big takeaway for this, where we think there's a lot of benefit for librarians and why I'm giving this talk today, is the fact that, you know, digitized historic newspaper records are a useful tool, not only for researchers documenting human history, but also natural history as well. Um, so with that, I want to kind of move forward to some tips and thoughts about um, what we can do as librarians or archivists to empower natural history researchers. Number one is something that, you know, we all are already passionate about doing, and that is making collections digitally available. Um, and I know I'm running short on time, so I'm wrapping up real fast. Uh, two, uh, understanding our collections well when we go to advocate them to uh, natural history researchers. They are not interested in fictionalized accounts of historic places. They are interested in actual historic accounts, even if there are by non-naturalists. Um, and then also when it comes to, you know, the other thing that can really help is if we tag collections 
questions with scientific names or at least useful common names. You know, I like to say, think like a naturalist when you're choosing that, ask a local biologist, um, you know, talk to your state wildlife agency. They'll know what species are concerned, both past and present. And don't think about just fauna, flora matters too. Um, try to consider integrating tagging for natural history into your workflow. Uh, remember, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Like, you know, we wouldn't expect people to overturn and start doing this tomorrow. But, you know, if you see something that's interesting, make a note of it. And the other thing we thought about that might be great is to do an outreach activity, like an archives bio blitz, where you open up your archives and encourage local naturalists, biologists, students, and citizen scientists to look through archival collections actively for scientific names or natural history relevant information. So to wrap it up real quick, basically the natural history of bobcats appears more complicated or, or in Ohio compares uh, to be more complicated than we thought. We know that historic records can inform natural history, not just human history. And there's things that we can do to improve discoverability of natural history uh, for special collections. So thank you. If you have questions uh, that there's not enough time to ask here, feel free to email me. Um, and my research gate is linked there. Thanks, Nick. That was good. That was cute pictures, by the way. Next up, we have tailoring the ACRL framework for information literacy to your campus lessons from implementation science. Lauren Perkis from Carnegie Mellon University. Lauren, you're up. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be here today. Let me share my screen. So today I'd like to talk about tailoring the ACRL framework for information literacy to your campus. Can everyone see my slide? Okay, yes. no one's complaining. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Martin. <laughs> All right, so first I'll talk about how we got here. Um, information literacy in a changing world, navigating a shifting landscape, and the ACRL framework for information literacy. I'll briefly describe some of the existing tools and resources for academic librarians to use the framework to enhance information literacy on campus, extend the arc of learning throughout students' academic careers, and advance other academic and social learning efforts at colleges and universities. And the framework is designed to be implemented differently at different institutions. So I'll talk a little bit about how in the field of medicine, an approach called implementation science guides just this kind of contextualized implementation of evidence-based frameworks and practices. So I'll wrap up my short talk today with a four-step approach to identifying and pursuing pathways to change on your campus. So we are all aware of the rapidly changing higher education environment and that the changes that we see in post-secondary education are deeply intertwined with changes in infrastructure, information and communication technology, knowledge production and the social role of our institutions. The world just keeps on changing and so we have to change our practices along with it. Students at our institutions are diverse and they have a wide variety of educational and personal experiences when they arrive at the beginning of their post-secondary education. Some of them have been exposed to ideas about the construction of knowledge or the prevalence of misinformation. Some already think of research as inquiry, and they might even have go-to strategies for finding appropriate, reliable information. But most students start their post-secondary adventure with none of these skills. They generally have a snapshot of the information landscape in which they've spent their formative years, including fluency with search engines and news sources that were prominent and accessible and they have culturally constructed ideas about authority, research, and scholarship. They might have been guided by peers, parents, and educators who form a version in a very different information ecosystem. It's widely acknowledged that we have to integrate information literacy throughout post-secondary education so that students can become self-directed as they develop information literacy. And faculty grapple with the same contextual challenge. Professors who've been working at an institution for three or four years learned to conduct their research four or five years ago. And let's face it, it was probably more like 10 or 15 years ago. So the information ecosystem was very different then. Fostering information literacy in students is a challenge even for those who are steeped in the current information ecosystem. It's even more challenging for faculty whose expertise lies elsewhere. So we all, students and professors and academic librarians alike, are trying to navigate this constantly shifting information landscape. As librarians, we have to identify core disciplinary concepts and collaborate with students and faculty around information literacy. 
The ACRL framework for information literacy for higher education is built on the belief that information literacy as a reform movement rests on rich, persistent engagement with core ideas by academic librarians and their partners in higher education. This framework is based on a cluster of interconnected core concepts with flexible options for implementation, and it's organized into these six frames. Authority is constructed and contextual. Information creation is a process. Information has value research as inquiry, scholarship as conversation, and searching as strategic exploration. The framework lays out the core concepts central to each frame, a set of knowledge practices, and a set of dispositions. These are incredibly powerful and well-crafted. The hope uh, and expectation is that academic librarians can use these to develop information literacy on their campuses by using the framework to develop one-shot sessions, to support efforts across campus, to integrate information literacy into the cur curriculum broadly. So the framework embeds this idea that librarians will contextualize um, and integrate information literacy at their own institution according to its unique characteristics. And that, that means it'll be effectively implemented at different institutions in different ways. But of course, making this work isn't always easy. So in the years since the framework was developed, the number of tools and resources to support implementation has expanded. Uh, today, it includes the framework document itself, which has an appendix on implementation, the ACRL framework for information literacy sandbox, which is a platform and repository for sharing framework materials, the ACRL framework for information literacy toolkit, a professional development resource to support understanding and use of the framework, remote and face-to-face -face workshops to better understand the framework and how to use it on your campus, translation into at least half a dozen languages, and a suite of books and articles built around the framework, as well as other resources. So we have this incredible list of resources. We have this framework designed to support librarians and our partners on campus as we work together to re-envision information literacy in light of the ever-changing information eco ecosystem in which we operate. To truly remake higher education and achieve programs that intentionally and effectively foster information literacy in connection with student success, including integrating information literacy goals into curricular and educational objectives and in partnership with others on campus, there, there are a lot of different places to start. So ultimately, the goal isn't to start. We have to start somewhere, but my question is, if we're going to see these concepts deeply integrated throughout educational practice and student experience across our expectations, how do we aim for that big goal? How do we figure out where to start and how to proceed in order to ensure that we can, as best we can, <laughs> support success or pursue success? Librarians might be superheroes, but we can't be everywhere at once. And at a lot of institutions, we don't have the personnel to dedicate a whole lot of time and effort to this particular campaign. So even where we do have human and other resources to dedicate to this time and effort, librarians can't be everywhere at once. We can start with conversations, sessions for faculty and students and so forth. But in order to move beyond these, it can be helpful to have a plan for implementation over the long run that's flexible and tailored to a particular institution. In order to disseminate these principles beyond library instruction so that learning objectives and practices rooted in information literacy are in place even where academic librarians have not directly had a hand in crafting the educational experience, we need some additional strategies. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that in the field of medicine, an approach called implementation science guides exactly this kind of contextualized implementation of evidence-based frameworks. 30 years ago, medical researchers realized that they just kept publishing new information about how to keep people healthy and treat illnesses effectively but that doctors, the practitioners, weren't aware of this flood of new research and treatments. So the actual practice of medicine didn't keep up with the state of art, the art knowledge about how to practice medicine. The National Institutes of Health asked, how do we bridge this gap between research and practice? And three decades later, implementation science is a really important domain of its own that supports rapid and radical changes in fields ranging from public health to education. So we can use ideas from implementation science to take our new understandings of shifting knowledge landscapes and make meaningful deep changes in the way that people move through the world. For example, if research indicates that people should wear, make lifestyle changes, telling them doesn't work. 
if we tell people to wear a seatbelt or get more exercise, most people don't just make those changes because we've told them to and told them that there's research to back it. If we want doctors to help people make lifestyle changes, we need to give them tools to support those changes. So what does work? Coordinating incentive programs, public health campaigns, and regulatory change. So these aren't changes that one person can make on their own because people operate in systems. I'll come back to this in a second. Effectively, it means that everything that about how we move through the world is interconnected. We do what we do because it's part of a larger set of practices. So we can't just ask people to make one change without considering the way that change affects other aspects of life and practice. To extend the medical analogy, asking a professor to just make the change from whiteboard to smart board because smart boards have more functionality isn't enough. Telling a department chair to get faculty to make the change from whiteboard to smart board is not enough. We can go through department chairs, but we still need those incentives, supports, and other tools to help practitioner make changes to their practice. And change doesn't always happen smoothly or and steadily. So if we want to know whether our strategies are working, we need metrics. So where can we start? We can start with the idea of systems. People operate in systems. Teaching faculty and students operate in a particular curricular and disciplinary context within a specific institutional policy environment and a given infrastructure. All of this happens in a larger cultural and socioeconomic context. And we have to take these into account if we want to foster effective change. So what does this mean for us as academic librarians? particularly if we're interested in implementing the framework for information literacy on our campuses. Well, first, implementation science offers us an approach. We can bound the system. That is, we can look at all of the elements that make up your institutional system, being careful to identify levels, niches, organizations, existing efforts, actors on campus, anyone or any element of our institution relevant to bringing curricular change and student success. So this includes identifying things like the Center for Teaching and Learning, the Office of Undergraduate Education, or other units for which synergies exist between this approach and other institutional curricular activities. Next, we can consider the content of that system. So what are the norms, resources, regulations, operations, and so forth that keep a system operating the way that it does? And how do they play a role in making curricular changes or otherwise shaping elements of student and faculty experience relevant to the framework? Then we can assess interactions across the system. So this means things that reinforce one another or that have to be balanced, interdependencies, system feedback, self-regulation, and interaction delays. So that is, how do decisions that are made or actions that are taken in one arena affect decisions or actions in other parts of the system? Finally, we identify levers for change. That is, we find parts of the system that are likely to have effect across different levels of the system to direct system behavior, and that might be open to change, something that's changeable. So it can be helpful to identify interactions and patterns to leverage for change. So system differences that create niches compatible with change goals, longstanding patterns that hinder or support goals, gaps in feedback mechanisms, necessary cross-level or cross-sector connections and that sort of thing. So for example, if I look at my own institution, I find that we have a robust and widely respected center for teaching and learning. The center shapes institutional policy and infrastructure and has cross-level effects. The Everly Center can shape institutional culture and has impact on curricular and disciplinary efforts across campus. So that means that collaboration with the Everly Center can lead me to influential faculty who play key roles in curricular redevelopment efforts, who have change goals that are well aligned with framework concepts. And of course, the partners on each campus might be different and might be distributed in different ways. But identifying um, partners with whom to work and identify, agreeing on intended outcomes, identifying metrics for success so that you can measure that change, follows implementation science and offers a pathway to success. No matter what, change is hard. Moving from theory to real change in practice and that scale takes an unpredictable amount of time. And so familiarity with the intervention you'd like to scale with the engagement and the system that you're working to change and careful selection of partners is key. Then we can only recognize change if we put the metrics into place to measure that change early by measuring a baseline beforehand and then looking for change over time. We have to have the patience to see that change, see change through, especially when it's incremental or sporadic. 
So effective implementation requires incremental strategies enacted with partners that enable us to tweak existing practices so we're not asking too much of our partners at a given moment. This makes on-ramps to expanding implementation within a given campus system. It can also be helpful to find times that people are already learning and developing new approaches, such as faculty orientations and mandatory trainings, since change is already underway. And finally, partners in classrooms, departments, and other units across campus are vital to building the conversation and ensuring that there's a robust support network for people working towards change. If we want the framework to have a life beyond the library, we can take concrete steps derived from implementation science to identify and support partners on campus and effectively scale our efforts. Community-based participatory methods are key to successful process change. Thank you all for your time today. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you both so much, so very much. Sorry about the timelines on that. Um, thank you everyone who stuck with us. It's time for lunch, so let's go get some food. If you have any questions, please email them. Uh, they will they will get uh, back with you when they can, uh, which would probably be very soon, and uh, at least tomorrow because you know it's a conference. So thank you all and uh, have a good lunch. Okay.